All right, everyone. Um, I think it's time to start today's seminar, and I'm very, very pleased to have Chelsea Rotman here. Um, Chelsea is currently an uh, assistant professor at the University of Toronto. She's originally from Arizona and grew up in the University of California system at uh, University of California in Davis in San Diego, um, where she did uh, her uh, undergrad and then PhD. She did uh, a couple of postdocs, including a prestigious David Smith Fellowship by the Society for Conservation Biology, which um, she already did uh, partly in Toronto, where she is now and today building a very vibrant and very much uh, noted lab in um, the ecology of plastic pollution and the wider issues um, around it. So um, I'm really, really pleased, Chelsea, you could make it here. We're very sad to not have you in person. So hopefully we can do that at some point, but um, thanks for joining us and thanks for um, doing a seminar for us today. Yeah, thank you so much. I also am sad not to be there, but I'm really pleased to at least be here in some way. Um, so what I thought I would talk about today was sort of a combination of the trends in terms of plastic emissions. So what we expect over the years uh, based on current trends in population growth, uh, plastic production and kind of environmental trends in terms of uh, mitigation strategies. Talk a little bit about why that matters, um, that there's plastic in our oceans and in our freshwater ecosystems, and then spend a tiny bit of time at the end talking a little bit about um, what we can do about it, both kind of on a local individual scale, as well as what the Canadian government, uh, what are the steps that they're taking. So I'll jump kind of right into a little bit of an introduction on the issue of plastic pollution and then talk about trends in plastic emissions over time. And when I say plastic emissions, I mean the emissions of plastic waste um, out into the environment. So for me, this issue sort of started to at least reach my attention around 2006 and everyone kind of learned about this issue in a different way. For some, it was microbeads and face wash. Uh, for me, it was learning about what they call the Great Pacific Garbage Patch or this area in the middle of the ocean that was said to be accumulating plastic pollution. This article written by Ken Weiss in the Los Angeles Times in 2006 won a Pulitzer Prize and was what introduced me to the issue um, while I was studying abroad actually in undergrad um, as an undergrad at UC San Diego. Since this time, I've learned a lot. It's not just about the garbage patches in the middle of the ocean. And I think a lot of people are coming, of course, to realize that as well. We now know that this contamination is global. Um, and it's while a lot of it, and by weight, most of it are large pieces of plastic, which include bottles and fishing nets. Um, but the majority of it are these small pieces of microplastic. So during my uh, beginning of my graduate career in 2009, I had an opportunity to hop aboard a research vessel at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and actually go to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. When we got to the quote unquote patch, you know, we realized there's no island of plastic pollution. There are big pieces floating around. But when you look over the bow of a ship on a calm day, the majority of what you see are these small little bits of plastic that are about the size of a pencil eraser and smaller. And over the course of my career, of course, what I've learned is that they get even smaller than what the eye can see. And that the majority of what we have out there by count are microplastics. And they range in size, you know, down into the nano scale, which means that from an ecological perspective, they can, they're bioavailable to, to nearly, um, well, and to every basically level of a food chain. And when we think about microplastics, they're actually quite a complex contaminant. So just like when we talk about pesticides, we know there are many different types of pesticides, same with trace metals. For plastic, they come from a range of different polymers that make up the plastic types. They have many different chemicals added to them to make them flexible, to make them durable, to give them color, to make them flame retardant. They come of course from different products, which is what makes them have all of these diverse polymers and additives. Once they get into the environment, they break down continuously into many different size ranges. They take on different shapes, which can tell you something about where they came from. And then they actually tend to accumulate contaminants uh, once they're out in nature. So they become kind of these little diverse complex particles floating around in the, in the environment and in the ocean um, that have quite a cocktail of contaminants on them. And what I think we're really starting to understand over the last, gosh, probably only a few years is how ubiquitous this contaminant is. And actually Boris has written a paper about this comparing 
plastics, microplastics to persist in organic pollutants in that they're ubiquitous, just like persistent organic pollutants. They're incredibly persistent. Um, and we're starting to understand that they, they at least can transfer out of the stomach of animals into the tissues and potentially um, bioaccumulate, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And they've truly gotten into a lot of the major planetary cycles, which I, I actually find fascinating to think about is that they're cycling in the water cycle. We know that they're depositing down on the earth with um, rain. We know that they follow global dust cycles now in a new paper in science by um, Brawny et al discovered, or at least met talks about this um, from looking at microplastics in national parks in Utah. Um, they're of course getting in through every level of the food chain. And there's also some great work coming out that talks about how the, the carbon from the plastic is actually getting into leaching into food webs. And so they truly are becoming a part of some of the greatest cycles that we think about when we think about both the biological and physical cycles on our planet. So how did we get here? Just want to back up quickly and think about that. You know, how did this material that was once so new and exciting become so ubiquitous and then become a persistent contaminant um, like PFAS or one of the contaminants we think about now that are kind of these forever uh, chemicals? So right after World War II, plastic uh, production really started ramping up as we had the rise of convenience materials and, and, and uh, consumerism. And this is actually the cover of Life magazine from quite uh, just, I can't remember the exact year, sometime in the early 50s, uh, celebrating basically this idea that a housewife in this time could invite many, many people over for dinner and just throw away the dishes at the end of the day because we had this new convenient material. And we really started to see the rise of this con convenience item. At this time, we produced about a half a million tons of plastic per year. Today, we produce about 400 million tons of plastic per year. And almost half of what we produce are these single use items that we use once, maybe twice, and then we simply throw them away. And so over the course of our time with this material, we produced about 8,300 million metric tons of plastic on this planet. Some of it is still in use, a good chunk of it. I'm talking to you on a computer that's made out of plastic. The glasses on my face are made out of plastic. I don't intend to use that once and throw it away. But for the material that has become waste, the majority of it has either been discarded in landfill or entered the environment due to a lack of waste management infrastructure. Less than 10% uh, of it or about 10% of it has been recycled and another about 10% of it has been incinerated, either waste to energy or simply burned. The recycle is the mechanical recycling. So that's something that absolutely needs to change. We need a less linear economy for plastic and something more circular. And when it comes to what goes into the environment, um, a paper by Jenna Jambeck, who was, that was published in Science in 2015, predicted that 8 million metric tons of plastic every year goes out into the ocean. And so this was ocean specific and it was predicting the amount from waste that uh, went out into the ocean. This statistic actually became the statistic of the year. It's the statistic I hear often at policy meetings. Um, and so I think it's safe to say that in 2015, the world sort of decided that 8 million tons of plastic emissions going into the ocean was not okay. We didn't know why if there's not a threshold for harm that's understood. There's no, we don't currently know how much is too much, but definitely if you listen to people on the policy stage, 8 million tons became this marker of, we need to go below this amount. And really started to see the conversation shift in order in terms of people starting to do something about it. So when I first started my career, people weren't thinking a lot about plastic pollution. It wasn't an issue that was being talked about by the United Nations and you know, our own governments, et cetera. Um, but today it really is. And so you're seeing governments around the world making commitments, including through the Sustainable Development Goals and the Our Ocean Conferences. But what was striking to me and to colleagues of mine uh, for the project that I'm about to discuss is that, like I said, we didn't have a target for how much was too much. A lot of people were making commitments about what they were going to do, but a lot of them were qualitative. They weren't quantitative goals. And so we weren't being able to measure what our, our baseline and then what we were actually reducing it to. So we saw this real need to be able to understand how do we expect emissions to increase over time. And based on what people are doing, how much will it matter? And how much do we actually have to do to get below this sort of artificial threshold of 8 million metric tons? 
So this is where we started a project that we sort of called our Plastic Futures. Um, but really what it was is a working group at Sysinc in um, Maryland. So we were doing, we would meet up in Annapolis um, twice a year uh, with a, a large group of colleagues and you can see them all listed here. And we had a couple objectives to the project that we were working on. And the first one was to simply, not simply, but to produce a model uh, that predicted plastic future inputs into aquatic ecosystems. So we went a little broader than the ocean um, under different scenarios and similar to a, an approach for carbon emissions for climate change. And then we wanted to evaluate the effectiveness of existing intervention strategies for reducing plastic pollution to aquatic ecosystems. So when we started this, we did something pretty similar to what Jenna Jambeck had done in 2015, and she was part of our collaboration, where we started with World Bank What a Waste data and population data. And we simply multiplied the population uh, within a country. So this was done per country, and then we added it all up to get global emissions. So within a country or an economy, we had the population, the waste per capita, so how much waste a person produced, multiplied by the proportion of that waste that was plastic, multiplied by the proportion that was mismanaged. And that tells you for any given country, how much plastic is basically being allowed into um, the environment, which includes a city street. So just not being managed properly, being contained within a landfill or some sort of waste management system. Then we took that information and we used a hydro sheds model to say based on where it falls on the ground in a mismanaged way, how far is it from a water body? So any, any water body within a watershed, a river that would carry it into a lake or ocean, as well as the topography taking into account. So if something was more than 100 kilometers away from water, that disappeared out of the model. Otherwise, the further you were from the water body, the less likely that plastic was to enter the system. Putting these two things together, we then figured out basically how much plastic was emitted by each country around the world where we had waste data. And then we projected out into the future from 20, um, starting in 2016 out through 2030 using uh, what we project to be populate, population growth by uh, also by the World Bank, and then also the um, predictions in growth for plastic production. So other ways you can change our future is by reducing population growth or by changing plastic production. So we figured out that in 2016, 19 to 23 million tons of plastic were emitted into aquatic ecosystems, so freshwater and marine alike. So this was our prediction from our model. For 2020, for example, the year we just finished, it was 24 to 34 million tons of plastic. So that's quite a bit more than 8 million tons. And then we were trying to figure out how much effort will it take to reduce these emissions to reach a target, in this case, 8 million tons by 2030. And when we thought about different emission strategies, we basically binned them into three categories. One was plastic waste reduction. The reason we did this, I'll say, is that we sort of feel that a lot of the emission strategies fall into these three categories. There's a whole toolbox of things people can do out there to reduce plastic, same with to reduce carbon emissions for climate change. We didn't want to kind of prescribe certain solutions, recognizing different countries around the world, different economies, certain things are more um, favorable to them given cultural differences and also the resources that they may have available. So we put them into these three bins. If it was plastic waste reduction, this could include bans on water bottles or bans on certain single use plastic, but it also would include putting things into a circular economy, keeping it in the system, which means you're producing less plastic. Increasing waste management, so collection of the actual litter from, in our cases, we're lucky we have the bins that come to our house, increasing that type of thing around the world, and then cleanup. Once it was already in the environment, how much do you actually have to clean up? So we asked how much effort do you need from these three bins essentially in order to reduce plastic pollution. So we had a business as usual scenario going through 2030. So that means if we just continue doing what we're doing today and I'll show you what these numbers are so you have something to compare it to. Uh, then we had current commitments. This is based off of the Our Ocean conferences. So the Our Ocean conferences were started by John Kerry when he was Secretary of State. I think he started them in 2015. I might have that year wrong. They've continued, they've been run by Chile, they've been run by Palau, I think they've been run by Indonesia. A different country takes it on every year. Last year it was in Norway. 
when countries come to this meeting, as well as industry and NGOs, they make commitments. And so at the, through the meeting, people stand up and commit to different qualitative or quantitative goals. We took all the quantitative goals and used them to figure out under current commitments, how much do we predict plastic to be reduced by? And now, of course, not every economy has a goal. So then we said, OK, we'll take the average within a certain income level and average it across the countries. So when I show you data, it's going to be broken up by high income, upper middle income, lower middle and lower. And those are World Bank income statuses. And then we had our below 8 million metric tons. How hard do you have to work? So just to start showing you business as usual, uh, it, so I want you here to look at the yellow line. Unfortunately, you can see all the data in one slide. I probably should have fixed that. But here you can see the business as usual line. If we do, if we do nothing and continue where we're at now, we will produce 36 to 90 million tons of plastic emissions out into aquatic ecosystems um, per year. So each year by 2030. So that's quite a big difference from the original value. It's three or four times as much. And the other thing you'll note is you can see how this varies by income status, if you're interested in that. What this business as usual is, is no change in the amount of plastic waste. So continuing our current trends with population growth, plastic production increase, and how much uh, waste per capita we produce right now by country. For waste management, no change. Here you can see in a high income country, about 63% of waste is managed. And in low income countries, it's about 6%. And then you can see where they are in between. So we have a lot of work to do, including at home. And then for plastic pollution, it's just no change, kind of the small amount that's picked up each year by volunteers. Actually millions or 1 million volunteers were logged last year by the International Coastal Cleanup, but it's still less than 10,000 tons. So on the scale we're talking about, we just sort of had it as zero. Then if we go to the current commitment, so if we sort of do what everyone says they're gonna do now, how are we doing? People are, are suggesting a lot of things and a lot of them sound pretty good. So we said, okay, let's put them in a model and see how we do. So this is now the blue line, what we call the ambitious target because it is actually ambitious. And here we see that by 2030, it'll be 20 to 53 million tons per year by 2030. So in, on the low end, we will reduce from where we are now. But on the high end, again, we might basically double. So again, this didn't seem to be enough, but what is it? Well, it's no change for low income and up to a 10% reduction in plastic waste in the high income country. So that would be if you and I said, we're gonna reduce our plastic waste by 10%. Uh, so just think about what in your daily life you would need to do to do that. For waste management, it's an increase from 6% to 30% in low income countries, that's a lot. And in high income countries from that 63% to 90%. So that's not nothing. And then when it comes to cleanup, you'd be cleaning up, so of what goes into the environment, 10% of annual plastic emissions. And so to give you kind of a number of what that is, it's about three to 9 million tons of plastic, which is quite a change from 10,000 tons, which is why we called this ambitious. But as you can see, if 8 million, million tons is unacceptable, this is not enough. So our biggest question is how much effort will it take to be able to show governments around the world, this is how much we think you actually need to do. So the first thing we did is we pulled on each of those levers independently. So we started by if we're just reducing plastic waste, how much do we need to reduce? And the answer was 85%. So 85% around the world in terms of plastic waste 85% within each economy. If we are just managing our waste across all income levels, we need to increase our waste management by more than 99%. That's a lot, especially when you think of where the lower income and lower middle income countries are right now. And if we're just cleaning up, which I think all of us would say that's crazy, why should we only do cleanup, but we wanted to look, you'd be cleaning up 85% of annual plastic emissions, which is 30 to 77.4 million tons. I don't think any Seven or Mr. Trash Wheel uh, could do that very effectively. And really the reason we pulled on each independently was because we suspected that there's no one size fits all strategy. You really can't just focus on one goal in order to make a difference. We need something that looks a little bit more systemic and goes across all the different types of strategies. So then we incrementally increased each lever, each one of three bins by 5% until we got to our below 8 million metric tons. 
And so here, what we're asking for across the world is a 25 to 40% reduction in plastic waste per capita, 60 to 99% of waste around the world being managed, and still cleaning up a 40% of the annual plastic emissions after you have the decrease in waste and the increase in waste management. It's still quite a bit to clean up. And so the reality is, while this isn't impossible, it doesn't look easy. And at the end of the day, basically what we're saying is unless the growth in plastic production and use is halted, a fundamental transformation of the plastic economy is essential. And it has to be one where end of life plastic products are valued rather than becoming waste. Right now we have a very linear plastic economy. We need to bend the economy so that we're truly reusing and recycling and producing less from virgin materials. So when I get to the solutions, I'll focus on this a little bit more, but I wanted to then first talk about our plastic impact. Why does it matter? Why does it matter that there's plastic going in the ocean? Is it really just an eyesore or are there impacts to wildlife? This is actually the question I would say that our lab focuses on the most. We get pulled into and, and I enjoy it, looking a lot about the sources and, and trying to understand fate, working with governments and then the project I just shared with you. Um, but the reason I really wanted to become um, a scientist was to understand how it impacts the ecosystems. So I'll start by just mentioning that there's no doubt now we know that contamination is widespread. If you look across the literature of plastic pollution, it used to be that we didn't, you know, we, we knew very little. So in 2013, there was not a big body of literature. Today, there's a very large body of literature relative to what it was. The majority of it is, is demonstrating global contamination, including in deep sea trenches, as well as in remote Arctic and Antarctic systems. And then, as I said earlier, how they're coming, you know, depositing with atmospheric deposition, with, with um, precipitation. So they're also in the atmosphere as well as in the soils. With that widespread contamination comes bioavailability or contamination in wildlife. There's also no doubt anymore that they are, they have infiltrated every level of the food chain. This includes finding them in corals, finding them in organisms in deep sea trenches, uh, so benthic organisms that in fauna, also all the way up to sharks and whales um, and seabirds. And sometimes we find pretty high contamination. So in Lake Ontario, for example, um, just actually taking a fish from sort of where I, I look like I am on the Toronto Harbor, we find sometimes up to 900 particles in the gut content or in the gastrointestinal tract of one fish, which is pretty striking. And in sharks, sometimes it's thousands of particles in a single fish. So there, the contamination isn't always this way, but in areas where contamination is high, you're seeing organisms really being exposed to quite high concentrations. And one of the questions I'm really interested in is the fate of microplastics in a food web. So when you think about uh, persistent organic pollutants, which some people have argued plastic could be considered, often persistent organic pollutants bioaccumulate, meaning they increase, within, increase in concentration over time within an organism. And then they tend to biomagnify up a food chain at higher concentrations in predators. This is where I predict that plastics might actually be a little bit different than persistent organic pollutants. Microplastics have been shown to be able to bioconcentrate and translocate outside the gut content of an organism into, uh, in this case, you have uh, microplastic in a blood cell. We've seen it in the fillets of fish. Uh, others have reported it in, in livers and kidneys, other tissues. The question is how long does it stay there and does it bioaccumulate? I would imagine once a particle crosses over, it's pretty hard to excrete that particle. However, having a particle cross over in and of itself is not easy. So when you think about trophic transfer, every organism up the food chain has to then translocate more of this stuff. So I predict that it's actually a bit more of a biodilution scenario. We're trying to understand this. We see some evidence of um, of dilution as you go up the food web. But again, we're still trying to understand. The methods are tricky. So a lot of time right now, what we do is we'll take the filet and digest it and count, but we're starting to use pyrolysis GCMS to remove the gut from an animal, digest the entire organism and get a mass concentration. So these are questions I'm really excited about. I don't have results for you yet because we're still working on um, 
basically we have organisms from different levels within a deep sea food web and we're getting ready to analyze those to be able to ask these questions. But I do think here's where microplastics might sort of break that uh, the theory that we have about persistent organic pollutants. So once they're in the body of an organism, what are the effects uh, in the ambient environment? And I have ambient here because I'm not going to talk about human health. Um, I don't study human health. I get asked to pontificate about how it impacts humans all the time. And the reality is I just don't know. And so for the purpose of this talk, we're focusing, um, which I imagine you all appreciate um, in terms of aquatic ecosystems and wildlife. So what do we know about the effects of microplastics? And I'll talk a little bit about uh, macroplastics, but I'm pretty microplastics heavy just by nature of what we research in our lab. So when it comes to how microplastics can impact an organism, I would say there's three modes of impact and broadly modes, because of course there are many modes of impact. But the three broad categories I put them in are a physical impact, and then two different types of chemical impacts, one from the additive chemicals in plastics, and then one from the plastics that accumulate on the, or sorry, the chemicals that accumulate on the plastics from the environment. So from a physical perspective, entanglement is a pretty easy one to imagine, right? With large pieces of plastics, there's no doubt um, that entanglement harms an organism. And even ingestion, you know, there's plenty of papers about organisms washed up on beaches with a belly full of plastic bags or straws that have been shown through a necropsy to be the cause of death. When it comes to microplastics, a small organism with a small plastic, it can be similar to the, the scenario of the macroplastic in a macro organism. However, if they can translocate the tiny, tiny pieces, so here are actual particles in the liver and the kidney of a mouse, this is as close to human health as we'll get, um, but there's evidence that they can do this. Obviously, they're quite small particles. And this paper shows uh, inflammation within the tissues, which can eventually lead to tumor, but not always, as well as changes in gene expression. So they are bioactive um, within the organism. We've also seen in our own experiments, so Kennedy Bucci is a PhD student in the lab, she was looking at if you dose animals, so if you have fish in a, in a tank and you have them either exposed to the plastics where they can actually eat it, interact with it, versus plastics isolated in a bag within the tank and all they can do is leach the chemistry, um, do you see different effects? And here I'm just showing you mortality. And she found that with higher concentrations, so that's what that means here, higher concentrations of microplastics where they could actually interact with it, she saw a significant increase in, sur in survival uh, or in mortality, so loss of survival. And she didn't see that with the chemicals. So here she's seeing a, a physical impact of microplastics. But of course, there's also evidence of uh, toxicity from the chemicals added to plastic. A lot of the research you see people using when they're dosing organisms and doing toxicity tests with microplastics are getting pure plastics from like Thermo Fisher or companies that sell these plastics that are more additive free. But researchers that have looked at plastic products are finding that the, the chemicals that leach from these products can also be the source of toxicity. So in our own research, um, we have a paper where we were looking at fathead minnow and we're continuing to look at this and try to understand this is tire dust. So little bits of tire that come off of our car are also considered a type of microplastic. When we leach tire dust and expose the fathead minnow to the water, we see a few things that we see increased mortality, we see deformities. We also see this lack of pigmentation in the eyes within the fish. And we're kind of curious what causes this and how it impacts the fish as they get older. Does it make it so they can't find prey? Does it make it so they can't escape a predator? Or do they simply recover? So we're trying to understand this as well as what are the chemicals within the tires that cause this. Um, you might be familiar with a paper that came out maybe a month ago in Science by a group out of the University of Washington that found that what was causing mass die-offs and uh, mortality in urban streams of salmon in the field, they were able to trace this back to a chemical that was coming out of tires. So it seems like chemicals in, tired, in tires and then tire dust seem to be an additive that may certainly be a mode of impact for microplastic. Also, people have looked at other types of plastic products, ground them down, exposed, uh, in this case, worms uh, to the microplastics and found that if they leach the chemicals off, um, they don't tend to see as much of an effect as if they just have the chemicals leached alone or the plastic with the chemical. 
Then the next one that actually gets quite of, it used to get a lot of attention. It's slowly starting not to, because I think we're realizing that when it comes to how plastics impact organisms, this probably isn't the number one region, reason, is that when plastics end up in nature, they are, they themselves are hydrophobic. So they start to accumulate hydrophobic chemicals. I've never taken a piece of plastic out of the ocean that doesn't have DDT, that didn't have PCBs, that didn't have certain metals on them. And so they sort of are this little particle of a multiple stressor floating around in the ocean. However, those chemicals are in the ocean anyways. So one argument is, does that mean that plastics, uh, does, it, does it matter? Is it material specific? Um, one reason it might be is if it truly acts as a multiple stressor where you have a physical and additive chemical as well as a sorbed chemical um, effect. But in our lab, we tried to understand by just taking plastics off of the shelf, grinding them up, as well as plastics that have been in the environment allowed to accumulate some of these chemicals. Do we see differences in toxicity in fish when they're exposed just to the plastic alone or to the plastic that has been in the environment accumulating ambient chemicals? The first study is the same paper by Kennedy, who was looking at the differences in the toxicity between just the group that was exposed to chemicals and the group exposed to the plastic itself. Here you can see in this Lake Ontario treatment, so plastics that had been exposed to Lake Ontario, you see much more deformity and you see very little deformity here in those that were just exposed to the clean plastic. At the bottom, you're looking at histopathology slides from a study that I did during my PhD where I was exposing Madaka uh, fish to um, plastic that had been taken off the shelf and then that had been dunked in the San Diego Bay to try to understand how the contaminants affect it. Here in a control fish exposed to no plastic, you see a healthy liver. In a fish that was exposed to the plastic only, you see the beginning of um, abnormal hepatocytes within the liver, but not a full-blown tumor. And here to a fish that was exposed to the plastic from the bay, you see a full-blown tumor that comprised 25% of the liver. We also saw signs of endocrine disruption where the fish that were exposed to all of the contaminants together, there was some feminine germ cells within the gonads of male fish. In general, overall, we tended to see higher toxicity in the fish that are exposed to both the plastic and the ambient chemicals. Not a huge surprise. The question is how relevant is that when we think about management, knowing that you know a particle that's like a natural particle out in nature also has these contaminants. So the next step really would be to run a control where we put kaolin particles out in nature to accumulate the same contaminants and see whether we see a difference. So then when it comes to how these kind of broader bin mode of impacts impacts organisms, it's really important, I think, to look across different levels of biological organization and see how microplastics impact organisms. And some of these tell you more about the specific mode of impact, and some of it tells you more about an ecological effect. In addition to looking across different levels of biological organization, different studies look at different scales in terms of experiments. They might work down in a, in a well plate, asking really um, kind of precise, well, not precise is the right word, but more detailed questions with multiple treatments and maybe more replication going up into less controlled systems like mesocosms with less replication, but maybe a full community out into uh, natural or observational experiments in nature. And so one of the things we've been really curious of in our lab is to look across the literature and say, well, if you look at what everyone's done in terms of testing the impacts of plastic in general, big and small, what do we know when people look across levels of biological organization, different types of experiments and different sizes of plastic? So we've done two systematic review and meta-analyses. I'm gonna talk about the newest one because that's more relevant. Looking across the literature as it has grown in terms of both plastic and microplastic, what do we know? What is the weight of evidence about how plastic impacts wildlife? So this work has been done uh, with Kennedy, who I mentioned before, and then Matthew Tulio, who was an undergrad um, in the lab. He since graduated and moved on. But this was a paper that came out just last year in ecological applications, but it is going through the literature through 2017. So of course, we're missing some of the newest data and this field is growing so tremendously fast that um, a lot happens in those years. So I'll try to kind of say what we know now at the end in terms of what we might've been missing. But what we did is we compiled the literature and then we 
extract the uh, impacts that have been demonstrated or not demonstrated. Sometimes somebody tests a hypothesis about an effect and doesn't detect it. And we noted those that were detected or not detected for different sizes of plastic along the X axis and different levels of biological organization along the Y axis. So we're going through the literature and we're pulling out every uh, effect that has been looked for. We do this by doing a literature search with specific keywords within a specific database. Once we find these publications, we make sure that they're relevant. Is it primary literature? Did they actually test for effects? And then you can see here how many papers we included, the types of data we extracted. And then in this paper, we were able to do a meta-analysis. There was enough research, um, but still not a ton. And this is because there's not a lot of studies. As I said earlier, microplastics are such a um, diverse contaminant that in order to do a meta-analysis, we wanted to at least make sure there was some consistency among the studies. Were they at least using the same type of organism? Were they maybe using the same type of plastic or at least the same size range? So the meta-analysis, I won't have time to really go into today, but it was really only for crustaceans because there's been a lot more work done on crustaceans and that's mostly copepods. A lot of Daphnia as well. So here you can see, this is just kind of the overall picture. I'm just gonna walk you through what these graphs are and then we'll start to do some comparisons. So the darker the shading, the more effects were detected within an experiment. So an experiment was looking to detect an effect at a certain size of plastic um, or an observational experiment in nature, a certain size of plastic. And they were saying, do we detect it or do we not? If they did, they ended up on this plot. The darker the shading, the more evidence there is. The levels of biological organization increase from bottom to top. This is you know, gene expression, cell death, suborganismal effects down to death or behavior change up to changes in population size, et cetera. The first thing that stands out for macroplastic, we have more evidence of effect only at the higher levels of biological organization. This makes sense. These aren't laboratory studies. These are observations in the wild. Um, and a lot of it is entanglement or the ingestion I talked about earlier. Um, and no experiments as you, as you would suggest. And when it comes to microplastics, you see there's a more broad kind of stretch across the levels of biological organization, but not a ton of information, but I can tell you a whole lot more than there were when we did this in 2013. So here you can see the scale in terms of the number of observations. In the publication that we published in 2016, which was the literature through 2013, this is in the Journal of Ecology, the scale is much less. There were many, there were much fewer studies. And the other thing is we still had some evidence at the in the macro, much less in the micro, and much less at these higher levels of biological organization. So the field is absolutely growing, and there's a lot more evidence now of effects uh, being detected than there were before. And this is more because there's more studies. Um, so keep that in mind. It's not necessarily because there's more effects out there. It's because more people are testing them. Then if you say, okay, well, I'm interested to know how much of this comes from the marine environment, how much from freshwater, how much from terrestrial. Most of the work is marine. This field started in marine biology. Um, it started out in the middle of the ocean with biological oceanography. It slowly marched closer to land. Now there's a lot of freshwater ecologists and hydrologists working in the field. And we're starting to see people who work in soil science and terrestrial ecology jump in. So this is increasing with time. Um, but most of the information comes from oceans. The thing that's really interesting and kind of keeps me up at night is we saw, so not, not for macroplastic. For macroplastic, more effects were detected than not detected. These are the studies where they looked for the effect and they didn't find one. But when it comes to microplastics, there's no difference between effects tested and, dem and demonstrated or detected and not detected. And so the question I always think about is why? Now remember, microplastics are incredibly complex or diverse. Of course, different studies are using different doses. That's gonna matter a lot in terms of whether or not you see an effect. But even if we control for this, we still seem to see a lot of yeses and nos in terms of effect or not uh, tested or not tested. But remember, the plastics are different shapes. There are different types of polymers. There are different sizes. And then of course, also people are using different animals and experimental designs. So we wanted to sort of explore this and say, uh, do these things matter? Or is it, can we, the question I'm often asked is, 
what do, how do microplastics impact animals? And it's really hard to answer that question because it's almost not specific enough. It's sort of like saying, how do pesticides impact organisms? Well, it depends on the pesticide. So here we tried to sort of dig into these trends. So the graphs I'm about to show you will have the concentration of the particle on the y-axis and whether or not an effect was detected, detected yes, not detected no, and the number of dots are just the number of studies. So here, of course, you can see that as you get into a higher dose, there does seem to be sort of a threshold where all of a sudden effects seem to be detected. But what if we break it down by uh, different shapes or different polymer types? So here you can see that all of the, the yeses at these higher concentrations were spheres. It doesn't mean that spheres are necessarily more harmful. It just means that that is the only shape people are using when they get to these smaller size ranges because it's what you can purchase uh, at the store. And you tend to see higher concentrations used for smaller sizes. But the thing you might notice is that for fragments, there seem to be uh, more no's than yeses. And for but for fibers, there seem to be more yeses for no's. If we dig into this a little bit deeper, it does seem that the more complex shapes, fibers uh, actually do seem to cause more effects detected than not detected. So fibers may be more harmful uh, to organisms than spheres and fragments. When it comes to polymer type, I can't really say that we necessarily see a trend. Again, for most of these higher concentrations, they're just using more PE and PS. It doesn't mean that they're more toxic. And what about when you look across different taxa or different levels of biological organization? I don't really see a difference here when we try to prod it in different ways. Nothing really stands out. But when we look at size, so this is how long a study lasted. Not a huge difference here. But when we look at size, we do tend to see that for these smaller size ranges, the lighter colors, you do tend to have more yeses or all yeses than no. And when we look at this in different ways by uh, running different types of analyses, it does seem to be that the smaller particles are more likely to cause an effect and that the fibers are more likely to cause an effect. When it comes to polymer types, I think overall there hasn't really been enough uh, work done on it to fully understand how much polymer type matters. This has led to, to conversations, especially with polymer type of, is plastic, is it a particle toxicity or is it more of a chemical toxicity? And if it's a particle toxicity, does it even matter that they're diverse? I don't know. So there, I've actually been in a lot of these conversations lately, uh, particularly with the state of California that has legislation now about drinking water, trying to figure out whether it's particle or chemical toxicity. I think there's enough evidence out there that, there that the additives matter. So I'm not yet convinced that it's just a particle is a particle is a particle. But overall, in summary, I would say there are a lot more studies these days testing hypotheses about the effects of plastics on organisms. And this includes at the higher levels of biological organization, which was just not the case um, many years ago, or even just like five years ago. For large plastic debris, the big stuff, fishing nets, bottles, straws, there's really no doubt that plastic harms wildlife. But for microplastics, there's evidence that it can cause harm, but when and how is really complicated. And so further work trying to understand risk assessment for microplastic is ongoing. So then in this case, we need more studies that really test hypotheses about uh, the complexity of the microplastic, different shapes, type sizes, using both freshwater and terrestrial environments, because as you could see, there's a lot less information there. And then that also help us understand more environmental relevance. A lot of the tests, which I didn't really talk about, are in tanks using pretty high concentrations. So in our research group, we're really excited about a project we're starting at the Experimental Lakes area. We'll start with limno corrals within the lake, dosing them with different types of microplastics. And so dosing different freshwater communities and looking for uh, both the fate and the impacts uh, from the microplastics. And depending on what we see, we may scale up to a whole lake experiment. So this is something that's really exciting uh, that we were, were actually supposed to start last summer, but with COVID, our first corrals will be this summer, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, and then other people have really been digging into the risk assessment. So trying to use that information across the literature to see if they can pull out a threshold and then figure out whether the concentrations in nature are enough to actually be causing an impact. So both of these actually come out of Bart Coleman's group with collaborators. And so for freshwater, really all I want you to take home here is that at this kind of um, 
threshold of about 100 particles per liter, 100 microplastic particles per liter, it's where you start to see risk to about 5% of the population. These here are concentrations that are actually observed um, in nature. Uh, I would say the majority though of concentrations in nature tend to be um, in, the, in the smaller concentrations. But this here is the kind of that threshold of HC5. And then here, people looked at the concentrations in the oceans with the concentrations, the thresholds that may cause risk, and said in the ocean, what percent of the ocean right now is actually seeing measurable risk? And here you can see that in, so 2010, so we don't have a 2020, but where concentrations are high enough tends to be in the Mediterranean where you have low flushing and lots of urban community high population around it. But by 2050 and 2100, if we continue business as usual, we're expected to see more measurable risk in the ocean. Still have a lot to learn, um, but it's interesting to have people going in and using what we do know to try to do risk assessments. So the last thing I wanted to focus on just for a few minutes is talking about what we can do about it. And I wanted to share some of the work we're doing locally uh, within our lab and within the community, and then talk a bit about what Canada is doing federally, because there have been some exciting advancements. So within our group, we have started an organization called the U of T Trash Team. This is a group of undergraduate students, graduate students, some staff um, that focus on basically local solutions to the global issue. So here in Toronto, and we're starting to do some work in different parts of uh, Canada, including up north. Our mission is basically to increase waste literacy in the community and reduce plastic pollution, connect people uh, with the issue through fun, creative and practical actions and use education, public outreach, and scientific research to deliver evidence-based solutions. So we're sort of grounded in the lab with science, but then really trying to get out there and spread the word beyond academia. We do a few things every year. We do community outreach, we do school programs and solutions-based research. For community outreach, an example is we have a, an urban litter challenge every year where we do a beach cleanup, but we do it in the city and we talk about watersheds and why it's important to even clean up in the middle of the city and how that protects even Lake Ontario, even if you're, you know, kilometers upstream. We have school programs where our students create uh, lesson plans that they take into fifth grade classrooms. Of course, right now it's all online and it's been a huge challenge, but we're excited to get back in the classroom and pick this up again. And then finally, we have a project with Ports Toronto on the harbor, which we call our Fighting Floatables project. It includes trying to um, both track trash in the harbor to understand how it moves around when it enters where it goes. This summer, we'll be actually tagging bottles uh, with GPS tags and, and seeing where they go. And it also includes sea bins and other traps to capture uh, litter. We're having a workshop in March actually to kind of share what we're doing with people across North America um, which has been great. We've got about 100 different people registered from different NGOs and governments around um, both our country and then in the United States that want to learn about trash trapping programs, because I think if we are going to try to increase cleanup, um, this is one of them. We can't all do it with volunteers' hands. And then finally, I just wanted to share briefly kind of what the Canadian government is doing. So at the end of our paper where we said we have to do a lot more in order to reduce plastics beyond 8 million metric tons or below, um, we said we needed systemic change. And this included reducing or eliminating the use of unnecessary plastics, putting global limits for virgin plastic production. We incentivize fossil fuels now, as many of you are probably aware of. This makes it so that virgin plastic is cheaper than recycled content. If you're a company, why would you ever buy recycled content if it's cheaper to buy virgin? So having some way to either de-incentivize fossil fuels or incentivize recycled content. We need globally harmonized standards for recyclability and recovery so that everyone has the same rules. It's easy to understand. We're making products that fit into the recycling system, scaling up these technologies and continuing to prioritize cleanup. The plastic strategy that Minister Wilkinson introduced, I don't remember the month, maybe it was November, actually included little parts of all of this, which made me really happy. One is we have a ban on six single use plastic items, which falls under this reducing or eliminating the use of unnecessary plastic. They are putting um, a, a standard for recycled content saying all plastics made by 2030 have to have X percent, I think it's 30 percent, they're trying to figure this out, of recycled content in it. This will force a larger market for recycled content. 
Globally harmonized standards, you're seeing uh, extended producer responsibility spreading across the country. This means that the, the producers of plastic are paying for waste management, and then they're trying to harmonize it, at least within province, so that for here, at least, the city of Toronto has the same recycling rules as the community up north. It's very confusing to have a waste literate uh, public when it varies all across the world and people don't trust the system. Scaling up technology, we're seeing new recycling uh, facilities come in Alberta. We'll see what they look like, but Alberta is really trying to become the new hub for recycling. And then the federal government is, is funding a lot of cleanup projects, which include some of our trash trapping product, uh, projects. So we have, we have a long way to go, but at least I am feeling optimistic. So I, I like to put up this slide because the reality is it's not rocket science. We know exactly what we need to do. It's just a really big change and it's systemic change. So I think the question will be, are we willing, which is sort of the nature of a lot of our environmental issues. So I'll leave you with that. And I would be happy to take questions. I think I was a little over 45 minutes, but um, hopefully we still have time.